Hello, we can hear you, Amud. Hi. Okay. Yeah, I was scared that you can he can hear me <laughs> for a moment. Yeah. Well, um, um, well, thank you very much to all the people there. We're going to start the session. This is a round table session that is called a Digital Me, Being You, Women, and or Gender Diverse People Online. Uh, uh, in this session, we we wanted to highlight that the internet plays a vital role in our lives, but it's not always safe or an inclusive space, especially for two women and gender diverse people. This session we draw, we going in this discussion, in this round table that we're going to have, we're going to try to address the intersection of gender and you online, aiming to create a safe and inclusive digital uh, environment. We will try also to highlight the challenges like we face, like cyberbullying, gender-based violence, and digital device with the different panelists, we share uh, their expertise from the different backgrounds they are coming from. Uh, also, at the end, we would like to discuss some strategies to encompass policy, education, and digital literacy to hold online right for those for these groups and involve uh, diverse voices in internet governance discussions. Uh, the session aims to offer recommendation for multi stakeholder to take uh, some practical steps in addressing these internet challenges and, and fostering inclusivity and safety. Uh, the structure of the session will consist um, in a short introduction that I'm doing right now. Uh, also, then we then we going to pass to the part of the speaker when they going to have five minutes to present their uh, their the perspective or their vision or to share uh, any knowledge related to the topic and the policy question that were shared before with them. And then we're going to have a second part of the session that we're going to allow the public to also share their visions and make some questions if the, in the, in they want to. And finally, we're going to have like a, a final remarks or a conclusion if we can have a conclusion in this session. So we're going to start this round on interventions. We Ajita Pasarigu. She is from Indonesia and she is a test development and designing on a or a bully 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 idea at a web ad that was launching in 2020 in 2020 and which she will be sharing some insights about online gender violence um, in the context of their country and also in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, so the floor is your Ajita. Thank you, Omut. Um, hi everyone, I am Ajita and I'm currently the founder and executive director of Pull It Up. At Pull It Up, we are focusing on addressing online harassment in Indonesia by providing psychological legal support and anonymous reporting platform through our web-based application. On the issues regarding on the policies that can be developed to address the challenge faced by youth, women, and gender diverse people in digital space, I think I would like to touch on and provide a little bit of a background of what happened in Indonesia. So since the COVID-19 lockdown in 2020, Indonesia has witnessed a staggering 300% surge in online abuse cases and this leaving victims without access to essential legal and mental health support. And from our statistic, non-consensual intimate image abuse or NCNI has been a prevalent concern and its majority impacting young female. This issue also becomes very intricate due to its cross-border nature and often law enforcement feels powerless due to jurisdictional constraint and even with the recent passing of the law on sexual violence crimes in the country, which recognize NCII, 
the prosecution of perpetrators across different jurisdictions remains a significant challenge. So considering these, we did a policies that facilitate international cooperation to forge global cooperation amongst law enforcement to address cross-border jurisdiction issues. Emphasizing what our governments can do, I believe it's pivotal to strengthen global partnership to tackle online harassment. Engage tech companies, especially actively involving them to online platforms in policy development. We need social media, online dating, online gaming platforms to focus on both enabling reporting mechanism and also addressing post report needs, making sure that perpetrators are refrained and victims are supported. Um, it's also important to incorporate both and global local views, especially in the policy, um, knowing that the emerging issues like deep fake pornography using artificial intelligence, it affecting women and gender diverse individuals online, violating their rights and their mental well-being. So therefore, our policies must not only respond after, but must actively protect our digital citizens. Ethical AI practices and rules need to ensure that technology becomes a helper, not an enemy in our fight against online harassment. Also, policy should be our shield and made with the complexities of technological advancement and the ethical consideration of its application in mind. And I believe that uh, policies should safeguard every digital citizen, ensuring that technology serves as a beacon of progress, not a tool for perpetrating harm and fear. Um, coming to the aspect in terms of multi-stakeholder um, challenges and what we can do, I believe this point, the responsibility of multi-stakeholders is a paramount in constructing a safe online environment government, social media, tech companies, schools, parents, civil society. Each of us hold a unique and significant role in the prevention of online harassment. Government needs to advocate and enforce policies that foster a secure digital environment across legal enforce enforcement. Social media and tech companies have to incorporate safety by design principles focusing not only enabling report mechanism, but also effectively addressing post report issues, preventing further perpetrations, and partnering with NGOs to further support victims with psychological or the support they need. Schools, parents should embed digital literacy and ethical online behavior within educational structures. And civil society organization, we must continue to advocate for digital safety and support victims, driving policy development and ensuring accountability. And lastly, as netizens and young people, I believe we need to promote ethical digital citizenship, promote an upstander culture, and be committed to create a digital environment that is respectful, inclusive, safe, and empowering for all, regardless of age and gender. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Umut. Thank you to you for that bad insights um, about the situation in Indo Indonesia and, and how uh, this kind of risk that we have in face if intercross with mental health and policy making and another stuff that are actually really important to protect online. And now we're going with Holly Hamlet. She is a policy specialist at Consumer International. She leads the digital consumer rights world, including trust in digital marketplace, virtual economies, and data rights. Holly Privilege manages global consumer protection and empowering and empowering index, measuring the consumer landscapes of 80 countries worldwide. Uh, Holly, the floor is yours. Thank you. So I'll be talking about gender in relation to consumer protection and uh, how consumer protection frameworks are not gender equal. So women represent 51% of the population, which means that is also half of consumers worldwide as well. Um, and they have the majority of the purchasing decisions. They have the potential to drive the marketplace and with their purchasing power, 
about 65 to 85 percent of global purchasing decisions are made by women globally. And yet whilst they have this potential to influence the marketplace with these decisions, their specific needs and experiences as consumers are still not considered in the design of policy, products and services. And we see this from sexist advertising to online scams, male default products and services, barriers to financial accessibility, gender-based pricing discrepancies, uh, toxic and harmful products. The marketplace is not a level, play a level playing field for women. So when we look at the experiences of women in the marketplace in, rela in relation to consumer protection principles, and this is based on the UN guidelines for consumer protection, uh, we can see that women's rights as consumers are not being upheld and that these consumer protection frameworks are not gender equal. So let's give some examples of women's experiences in the digital space. We have an, a lack of access to essential services. In Rwanda, 84% of women have access to mobile phones, but of those 84%, only 55% have access to mobile money. Women's economic interests are not protected in the same way as men. The pink tax, as we all know, is a gender-specific form of uh, offering products, which is translated from traditional markets into the online space as well. So in e-commerce platforms, we see the same pink tax occurring there. In the US, we have personal care products for women costing 13% more money for women than men. Products are designed by default for men to contribute to and equal health outcomes as well. So we've seen this with VR headsets. Uh, they don't account for the eye width of women, and so women are experiencing cyber sickness as a result of this. We have product design, again, just ignoring women's needs with the mobile phones being the size for men's hands instead of women's hands. It's more difficult to hold, to type. We have uh, existing data contributing to gender discrimination, so any data that is used for AI algorithms are based on the reflections of society that we have at the minute, and that includes gender biases and discriminations. One common example is AI used for lending. There we have women are more disproportionately likely to be rejected for loans, especially black women as well. We have Poor design, allowing women to be sexually harassed online in spaces, uh, VR, AR, with the metaverse. This is a design fault. There is no form of consent. There's no uh, you know, consequence of what will happen to women. And then this is then further compounded with uh, difficulties in redress. Women are a lot less likely to seek redress when their consumer needs have been uh, infringed or disregarded. A lot of the times they won't seek redress unless they have the backing of a man in their household in a lot of uh, countries. So we have all these harms that are absolutely gender issues, but they're compounded by consumer interests. And this is a framework that is meant to protect, protect consumers worldwide. But we can see that the framework itself is not being respected for women. And so the framework is designed again for men, uh, with men in mind. But thinking about how we can address these policies and uh, develop them so that these challenges are mitigated, at least uh, gender equality in terms of access, uh, inclusion, skills, and leadership can only be understood and addressed through internationally comparable gender disaggregated data. So there is an urgent need for this data in policy, product, and services design. Without this, policies can be misguided, uh, gender biases can uh, remain and be reinforced and harm can occur. So even if we have gender intentionality in the design of these policies, products and services, without this data, we have no evidence and real understanding of how women are experiencing these things in the marketplace and how they have such an impact on them uh, to be able to you know, develop further and make sure that we have gender equality in digital spaces, in analog spaces, just generally as consumers in the marketplace. And so thinking of practical steps to move forward as well. 
to uh, work together in a multi-stakeholder approach. We can, of course, apply a gender lens to any work that we have uh, and ensure that women are in design and development roles. But this doesn't offer a global change that we need. To be able to get the data that we're looking for, this gender disaggregated data, we need to conduct more research. This includes product testing, product comparisons, looking into research for uh, policy, testing out redress mechanisms and seeing if women can go all the way through with them, whether they're stopped through uh, the time constraints, the uh, cost of this as well. And having this data, just knowing how women are experiencing this is gonna help a little bit more than just having women in the spaces so that we can, this is so that it's reflective of women everywhere and not just personal experiences shared in individual rooms. And this is something that consumer organizations can uh, help with, especially, you know, national consumer organizations do product testing, they do product comparisons, and a lot of them will share this on their websites. So this can be, you know, we can plug consumer organizations into different spaces. But with that, we need bridges for uh, organizations working in silos and making sure that we do have this multi-stakeholder approach. And this isn't just your traditional uh, policy, business, consumer organization. We also need to link in marketing agencies or uh, marketing authorities to make sure that messaging around products and services is also uh, not gender biased. Um, we can create public awareness campaigns to make sure that women are aware of their consumer rights. They can enforce them and they can try and live uh, a more uh, fair life in the marketplace if they're a little bit more aware of the consumer rights that they have. Uh, and then finally, it's just creating a little bit more visibility of the uh, issues that there are and making sure that there's space for this influence uh, of consumer issues because consumer protection can be a means to an end of trying to get to gender equality, uh, particularly with the links to economic interests that are in the UNGCP. This might be an easier way to gather interest and gain a little bit more influence. Thank you. Thank you, Holly, for the intervention. was really insightful because you put into cross the how some digital, how, how some economical rights in the, can also affect some human or another human rights. And also how data, gender, gender data is needed to actually improve the system in general, not only in the consumer aspect, but in all the system in general. So thank you very much for that. Now we going with Lufia Mulenga. She's from Zambia. Uh, she's a certified gender equality chain maker who founded the ICT for Health Club. She has over six years of experience in the STEAM ICT sector, uh, where she has um, advancing and development in innovation in local communities. And as I say, she's involved in the Internet Society Zambia chapter. Silufia, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, Umita. I hope I'm audible enough. Am I audible enough? Yes, yes we can hear you. All right, thank you so much. Um, I'll be touching <clears throat> a little bit on uh, how youth and gender diversity groups are present currently on internet related initiatives. Uh, so we have seen a prominent number, number of growth increasing in the youth and gender diversity groups in increasing and actively participating in internet, in internet related initiatives uh, across uh, various fields and it's Initially, because of a lot of education and you know skill development that has been advocated for for youths and young women in in various uh, industries, so we have uh, prominent youths and uh, young women, young girls, young men actively participating uh, in internet related fields because of the online platform that are advocating uh, for 
uh, gender related courses and uh, gender related initiatives. So mostly these online platforms uh, offer opportunities and also um, a chance for most of our youth and also our various diverse groups to again tech related uh, skills. And also there's been some prominent growth in uh, STEM programs that are promoting a lot of science, technology, and you know, a lot of engineering in, in all di diverse groups and uh, which mostly aims to engage young learners in, including girls and uh, gender diverse uh, individuals in these groups. There has been uh, over the years an increase in a lot of social media activi activism uh, that has helped uh, most of uh, the inclusive individuals and groups to use, like I said, uh, learning platforms and social media platforms to, to raise awareness about uh, various issues that promote inclusivity and also mainly just uh, advocate for social change uh, nationwide and also global wide. And also these uh, social media activism has uh, promoted a lot of um, online groups uh, that encourages uh, a lot of online communities to provide a safe space for individuals and uh, diverse group members from different backgrounds and different tech related industry to connect and uh, share experiences and just support each other. Um, also prominently, uh, there's been a lot of events uh, locally, uh, nationally, and just uh, globally like the I IGF uh, that help uh, to promote a lot of uh, diversity and inclusive uh, initiatives. Um, most most of, of, of the events actually help to, you know, focus more on inclusion and encouraging participation from, from a lot of youths and a, a lot of um, groups, marginalized groups, I, I would say, um, and individuals. <clears throat> To give them a, a platform where they can be able to share you know, various ideas and also engage from also engage with diversity people from different uh, backgrounds from different countries you share the challenges and also uh, some innovative solutions that can you know help increase the advocacy uh, and also the work uh, to amplify our voices in interrelated issues um uh, we do have a, a lot of open source and tech communities also to contribute uh, that help uh, engage a lot of youths and, 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 and young women and allows them to, to contribute uh, to any tech related solution that may help them um, develop some of their local communities and some of the initiatives uh, go as far as collaborating with developers to uh, develop uh, a, a software uh, application or even technology innovations uh, that can help them um, just um, engage with their local communities and find some of the uh, tailored solution that can help grow their local communities. And also it, it helps them have a voice so that they can be able to talk to their local governments and pe people that are making policies in, in their country. Uh, so with that, <clears throat> there has been uh, a lot of youth-led youth organizations uh, that advocate for internet policies that uh, uh, promote accessibility in digital rights and online safety. And uh, this has helped uh, a lot of people participate in discussions and also campaigns that help to shape the related uh, policies. I'll give an example for, for Zambia. Uh, we, we do have uh, members of parliament that uh, invite us to sit down and discuss with them and we're able to voice out our challenges and also provide solutions that may help to, um, that may help to uh, increase youth participation and also provide tailored, uh, tailored development in our local communities that mostly uh, bend on, on youth. Uh, there have been initiatives like uh, the CDF, uh, that's uh, the youth fund that helps uh, fund youth-led organizations to come up with uh, projects and initiatives that mostly help develop uh, their local communities. It, it can be a small business, uh, it, it can be a small learning platform, but all these initiatives have been uh, 
they have increased uh, participation in, in, in all gender diverse groups, uh, more especially in uh, marginalized groups. And also uh, just as a way of introducing uh, the digital environment to certain communities that uh, don't have the internet or uh, don't have access to, to actually participate on, on these online, on online platforms. So uh, the CDS has uh, grown uh, largely uh, in the country and it, it has helped a lot of uh, youth uh, engage to certain groups of people uh, who are learned and some who are, who are, who are not learned to, to just kind of actually voice out uh, what they need. Uh, these also, uh, they have helped provide tailored solutions because uh, it's not everywhere where they, they have access to water, it's not everywhere where they, they have access to um, uh, good health uh, facilities. So uh, the CDF fund has enabled a, a lot of youth-led or, or organizations to provide tailored solutions to these communities by um, empowering the communities to, to, to learn of what they can do instead of just waiting for, for the government to offer them money or to to come and uh, offer them a solution to, to to the problems that they are currently facing. Um, there has there has been also some uh, gender advocacy groups that have been um, created that helps uh, to promote a lot of gender di di diversity by actively engaging uh, policy discussions and uh, in advocating for inclusivity, equal opportunities, and also safety for for gender individuals online and as well as uh, offline. Uh, so a, a lot of <clears throat> uh, online active, uh, activism has led to some online petitions and also uh, youth-led campaigns that uh, uh, allow the gender diverse uh, active groups to, to use any uh, online platforms to launch petitions and awareness campaigns addressing a lot of prominent issues that still uh, affect us even in the 21st century in relations to gender, youth, and also women at a large scale. And uh, mostly of these issues um, have been addressed to, due, to, uh, due to the, te the technology. And uh, it, it has helped, uh, it has helped a, a lot of youth in, engage themselves in various topics that uh, affect them in their society, uh, like uh, justice, climate change, and also gender equality, and so on and so on. Uh, so just in summary, um, the youth and gender diverse individuals are very much uh, prominent participants, uh, and they have leveraged a lot of online platforms to learn, create, and innovate and as well as ad advocate for local change and also become um, policy change makers in, in their communities and also nation ones. And this, this contribution has played a very crucial role in, in shaping the digital landscape and also promoting inclusivity and diversity in the online world. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to you, Chilufia and for reminding us that the combination of advocacy with some that's a gut root work and, and technical or in general multi stakeholderism can be benefit for the for gain more digital right for Jewish um, women and gender diverse people. Now we moving we are for a speaker. She is Luisa Franco Machado. Uh, Luisa, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Umut. Well, um, good evening, Kyoto, morning, Berlin, um, and hello to everyone in between. I'm Luisa Franco Machado. I'm a Brazilian feminist social scientist. Last year, the UN appointed me as a young leader for the Sustainable Development Goals for my work in digital rights and data justice. Um, and currently, I advise JZ, the German Development Cooperation Agency, on the use of ICTs for development. However, today's thoughts are purely mine, not affiliated with any of these organizations. That's an important disclaimer. But now let's dive right in. Um, and I would like to actually begin with the shadows. So the silent, unseen censorship that many of us face online. So have any of you ever heard of shadow banning? For those who haven't, this is a sneaky form of online censorship. You post something and suddenly it's like shouting into a void. 
you know, especially if you're discussing something as radical as women's rights or systemic issues, you know, or even if you have a perceived female body and show a little bit of skin, unless you're a big influencer, TikTok will take you deep into this uncharted caves of the internet. Um, my post on TikTok, for example, when I try to talk about something slightly more political, they really vanish from my followers' feed. And sometimes shadow banning might seem like a tech glitch, but actually it's often a manifestation of deeper systemic issues, right? But the challenges, they don't stop there. The digital space can really be a minefield, especially for youth, women, and gender diverse people. So while it offers you know, a platform for advocacy and change, as we've heard in uh, previous speeches, the backlash, especially from misogynistic and alt-right groups, is real and it's intense and they are super organized and it sucks. <laughs> but it's not just about facing threats though. Sometimes oppression is much more subtle. You know, our personal data and our digital footprints, they are really constantly harvested by nearly every single institution out there, not just the, the, the tech giants. But does, they, does this data really contribute to public welfare, to understanding the needs of, let's say, gender diverse people or shaping policies? No, countries know close to nothing about their LGBTQIA plus population. Instead, the data collected is used to reinforce oppressive structures and drive profits, all the stuff we already know, right? And then of course, there's erasure. How many times have we encountered online forums asking gender, male or female? They're not just forms, right? They're a symbol of the binary restrictive thinking that should have no place in our diverse world. The occasional other option, it's a slap in the face, right? A, a gross oversimplification of our complex identities. Okay, so now what's the way forward? First, let's take a step back, because I know most of us have the attention span of a goldfish. So if you spaced out, now it's time to come back. <laughs> um, I mentioned at least five issues in the past three minutes. Shadow banning, fear of persecution, organized hate, data exploitation, and erasure of marginalized groups. That being said, our call to action is clear. First, we need and we demand a digital realm that celebrates diverse expression. And that's not, you know, just kind of like um, a buzzword. We really need and want spaces that champion feminist discourse and critical thinking and not suppress them. Of course, this doesn't mean allowing harmful content, but rather distinguishing between genuine critique and hate speech. Second, we need smarter content moderation. Platforms must invest in and reinforce rigorous content moderation to protect marginalized voices and dismantle hate-driven narratives. I know this almost sounds like too much to ask, but it's really not. But we don't just need to hope for that to happen, right? Which takes me to my third recommendation. Responsible public intervention in the online space is not a choice anymore. Regulating digital spaces or the data that is at the backbone of these spaces is just necessary. You know, look at Europe's uh, DSA and DMA. They are steps in the right direction, but they are just starting points, right? We need global yet localized efforts. So we really need to ensure that data collection of non-sensitive data, right, serves for what actually matters, understanding our community's needs and shaping policies tackling them. Last but not least, representation is non-negotiable. To every public institution or tech giant out there, if your team doesn't have queer, feminist, and diverse voices, you're doing it wrong. Stop sidelining us into the other box and start recognizing our worth. Institutions, they must not just include, but rather prioritize marginalized voices on decision-making. To wrap up, let's dream of an internet where every voice matters, but let's not just dream, let's act. So find me online, all my contacts are here, but if you can't see it, just search for Luisa Franco Machado online. 
Um, it's a huge step that we're making space for these conversations. So thank you so much for Umut and everyone organizing the session. Um, so let's keep this conversation going and let's foster a digital world that truly includes and celebrates all of us. Cheers to that. <laughs> thank you so much for that, Luisa. You touched a, tree, a topic that is close to my to everything that I do. So yeah, thank you, thank you so much for it. Well, right now we moving another online speaker. She is Daniela Kuspoka from Colombia. She is, um, wait a minute. She's a lawyer with student in economics and public policy. She worked several years in the CIS Commission of the Colombian Congress. Congress in charge of technology and um, policies and regulation. Additionally, is part of uh, the ISO Foundation as a volunteer, and she is a project focuses on the gender digital divide through digital literacy programs. So, uh, Daniela, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks, Sumo. Thanks to everyone. So today um, I'll be talking about the Colombian case, especially I will talk about the digital gender balance in the country. The challenge that Colombia has by developing a policy that faces the phenomenon, um, since violence is uh, the main human rights relation against women in the country and has become a problem of justice. So, uh, technically, digital violence is any painful action carried out with the support of information and communication technologies in terms of distribution, exhibition, commercialization of images, videos, intimate sexual content um, without uh, the, concept of the, the consent of the person, uh, which definitely causes uh, psychological and emotional damage to the victim. In Colombia, we have a, a generic law devoting to preventive violence against women. Um, however, um, we don't have any specific regulatory framework. Um, uh, we don't have a name um, that can um, maybe emphasize with legal um, enforcement about digital violence in the country. And since we don't have a name for that, we don't have data, and it still is not clear um, how's the way that government can act when this um, type of violence happens? So digital violence against women takes many shapes. It could be doxing, could be non-consexual dissemination of intimate images and so on. Now Colombian authorities lack the necessary awareness to respond um, and sometimes uh, women victims tend to be re-victimized or even blamed for what happened. There is also a lack of interest to investigate this type of crimes. And at the end of the day, this legal gap makes it difficult to have reliable and comprehensive data to create better public policies. And at the same time, uh, digital violence needs a particular response from the state, from the government, from the actors. Um, and the protective measures we need to um, in these type of cases uh, certainly are different. In the case of dissemination of intimate images, for example, uh, we need to have, uh, we need to take into account the impact that uh, has this phenomenon for the victim to put the, the victim at the center, give them psychological attention, for example. In September 2022, the Colombian Constitutional Court studied the first case of uh, women whose intimate photos were disclosed with our concept by another woman on Facebook. Um, this woman showed the photos to her colleagues and um, it was clear that releasing the images was intended to humiliate her using the traditional idea of how a woman should behave. Um, and the purpose obviously was to damage her reputation in the workplace. However, in this case, the Constitutional Court only focused on the protection of sensitive data. However, this year, fortunately, the Constitutional Court ruled in relation to online attacks that several women journalists have received with sexualized and misogynistic content. The court in this, in this time is different and um, forces multiple state actors to act against this violence 
So it asks all political departments and movements to create a code of ethics with guidelines to punish acts of violence or incitement to violence online, implement an acts rule for women victims of any type of violence. So um, as a consequence of this, um, of this rule of the Constitutional Court, several initiatives have been presented in relation to the development of framework inside the Congress, uh, but it is still pending of approval. Without a doubt, the state needs to recognize this digital phenomenon as a priority aspect to general policies to support victims, but also to empower women online. Women need to know that they have a healthy and safe space to also defend their rights. And um, I appreciate the invitation to participate today. And I give the floor again to Umut so that I can give uh, our way to uh, next panelist. It was a pleasure to share uh, the Colombian experience to all. Uh, thank you so much, Daniela. Well, we both are on the Colombia right now. We are like four in the morning, so thank you for the uh, the time. So I'm sharing the experience in the case of Colombia. Uh, now we moving to one of the speakers on site. He is Aiden Ferdinand. I'm hoping that's uh, your last name right. <laughs> he is a public interest technologist. <laughs> and Landeke Democracy Fellow with Human Being Action in collaboration with Alfred Landeke Foundation. So the floor is your Aidan. Thank you so much, Umut. I'm really pleased to be here. And the reason why I am on the stage today is because I wrote a report last year that was published by the National Democratic Institute that was exploring who is involved in making decisions within internet governance and internet coordination bodies. And we looked at the participation data over the past 20 years, and it was pretty clear that there was inadequate representation from women, from youth, from uh, LGBT plus people. There were also other demographics that were missing too, and there were demographics that were uh, given more influence than others, law enforcement, intellectual property interests, for example. And so, of course, intersectionality plays into this. Um, so the, what I wanted to really talk about was to build off of Louise's call to action at the end of her talk about let's act. What can we do about this? Part of the research that I did last year was speaking with leaders within internet governance institutions to understand how they perceive different stakeholders. How do they assess contributions that they receive? How do they act on the evidence that is presented before them? And something that I heard quite frequently was around that, you know, aside from the fact that there are disputes over what adequate representation looks like, it's also really hard to explain what adequate representation constitutes and is representation what we really want? Is it being on panels like this where with full respect to everyone in the room, we don't actually have many decision makers in this room. We don't have the IGF leadership panel. Uh, we have a few empty seats. Um, what does it actually mean to have representation? Do we want outcomes instead? What would be outcomes that we're happy with? And I would argue that effectiveness starts with how you conceptualize your work. And when I was interviewing different stakeholders last year for this project, something that came across very clearly to me when I spoke with civil society representatives who have very strong um, uh, mission-driven goals that they're working towards that are very important is the lack of a theory of change. There is this idea that the problems are so huge that we must solve them because they're so urgent and pressing, and that is definitely true. But I do think civil society in general is not very good at being able to manage trade-offs is not very good at being able to assess what is enough and what is not enough. And so to have a loud voice and to be able to give a good speech when you don't have a problem statement, it doesn't get you very far. When you can't, or you're not doing the stakeholder analysis, when you're not uh, <laughs> doing a power analysis, when you understand your own context but you don't necessarily understand the context that others are working within, 
I fear that it can undermine what we're all working towards. And so I think that for traditionally excluded stakeholders who are, I would argue, by design being excluded from some of these institutions, you have to be able to tell your story from a place of power. You have to be able to be an example of not how horrible and unfair the world is, because you are, of course, a victim. You are intentionally being excluded. But you do have to also have agency. And it's very difficult to develop agency when you are perceived by other stakeholders as victims of something. And you may be a victim. Again, you probably are. But if your advocacy comes from a place of victimhood, you just don't get sustainable results, or at least what I saw is you don't get sustainable results. You need to know how to set goals, how to prioritize, how to fight one battle at a time. And this is really difficult, particularly for advocates who are volunteering their time to focus on issues, who care about multiple things. It is so easy to be pulled this way, the other way, to be able to just really condense what you're focusing on to one or two issues and to follow them through. It's really difficult, but I think it's something that's really important for us to try to focus on. Uh, we are running out of time, so I'll leave my remarks there, but very happy to uh, expand on any suggestions if you like about. Uh, thank you very much, Aiden, and thank you for sharing the call to action that is actually needed for all of us in this kind of processes. Now to finally finalize this uh, panel of speaker, we have Vera, Vera Saken. She serves as USA Chief Digital Democracy and, and Rights Officers. Uh, officers. Uh, she's situated in the Center of Democracy, Human Rights and Governance, and she is the ag agency's agenda on digital democracy to ensure technologies advances democratic values and respect for human rights globally. Uh, Vera, the floor is yours, and thank you so much for actually being there at the, at the hour, because I was so worried about it. <laughs> I don't know, but I don't know, it's just me, but I cannot hear you. How about now? Okay, perfect. Uh, yeah. So yeah, thank you so much for hosting this. I'm delighted to be here. I just um, actually literally just got off the flight uh, from the United States, so I'm glad I was able to make this. Um, and then also, um, you know, I represent the voice of government, but also the voice of the United States government. Uh, and I have some colleagues in the room as well that I would be remiss not to announce, uh, to acknowledge, including my very dear friend and colleague, Kaylin Crockett, who represents the White House, uh, who uh, may and others, you know, may have a few things to say on this topic. So what I wanted to do is bring a U.S., uh, not just the U.S. government, but the government perspective uh, to this topic. Um, you know, um, first thing is first, you know, for multi-stakeholderism, we know in the digital realm, multi-stakeholderism is everything. And it's from both in the global and the normative settings and also in convenience like this, but also at the local level in a lot of the uh, countries where a lot of the countries are operating in. Uh, and multi-stakeholderism does require governments, civil society, and yes, private sector, like really private sector at the table, and not just the big tech, but emerging tech. So on the government side, uh, the United States um, has been doing quite a bit along with a number of other countries, 11 countries to be exact. Um, the Biden-Harris administration announced recently, not too long ago, the Global Partnership for Action on Gender-Based um, Online Harassment and Abuse. And it really is in concert with 11 other nations. It really also has a multi-stakeholder advisory group composed of survivors, civil society, activists, private sector, and others. And the reason is because we in the United States are extremely committed to investing in preventing tech facilitated gender based violence and also related gendered disinformation and all of the ills that are happening to women, girls, uh, gender diverse LGBTQ plus uh, people. 
And so I do want to tell you a little bit about a couple of goals of uh, the partnership. And again, I'd be delighted for Kaylin and others to highlight as well. Um, but I do want to kind of highlight a few goals of what the U.S. Agency for National Development, which is the United States Foreign Assistance Arm, is doing. And some of it, quite frankly, I've actually been able to see it myself through a lot of the work than a lot of the places I've been to already in my current role. So the first is... There's three big goals that I want to just cover real quickly. One is to close the gender divide, the gender digital divide by promoting online safety, accountability, and meaningful connectivity. That's foremost. We see so, in, fundamentally, access and connectivity are everything. Uh, I can tell you from the USAID, we have been investing in this space quite significantly um, in a number of countries. Uh, one with the Reliance Foundations, we announced actually seven winners of Women Connect Challenge in India is one example, but we're doing this uh, in different parts of the world in uh, a number of countries that we operate in. Um, the second is uh, really promoting meaningful participation and meaningful participation for women and girls and LGBTQ plus um, in, gen in gender diverse uh, population. Okay. Did I lose you guys? Okay, good. Um, by countering tech facilitated gender-based violence and uh, gender disinformation. I cannot begin to tell you how important this piece is. When women are at the table, that's when meaningful change happens. We have seen it again and again. There's data, there's research on this, and this involves not only making sure that we are investing in women and girls and LGBTQ plus communities to ensure in all sectors of a society, including in political life and civil society, but also, I think you mentioned also in the tech sector as well, how critical this is. And here's why, and I can even speak a little bit on the tech sector, having come from the tech sector into the role that I'm currently in. Because when Women and girls, when women are at the table, this is when we're talking about to ensure that human rights assessments uh, are uh, part of the product features. Uh, it is also making sure that uh, we are in the room when meaningful decisions and change happen at all, all facets of society, but also most especially in the technology sector where a lot of the, if you will, decisions are being made. And one, by the way, when I talk about tech, I'm not just talking about the big tech, but I'm also talking about emerging technologies as well. Because again, uh, having that cultural knowledge, having that gender, if you will, or LGBTQ plus knowledge, and the contextual knowledge on how these products need to be designed is just so important. Um, and one of the things I can tell you at USAID, um, one of the things we announced at, this, at the last Summit for Democracy is the Transform Initiative, where we're actually trying to bring and really increase uh, that participation uh, in the civic life uh, for women and, women and girls. And we're actually doing a number of uh, pilots in the coming year, most especially in uh, Guatemala, Georgia, and Kenya. But I actually, I will tell you on this one, I actually was able to see this myself. Uh, in May of this year, I was in the Middle East and North Africa. And this is where I saw, first and foremost, where women have been especially victims of tech-facilitated gender-based violence, uh, as well as gender disinformation, and online hate and harassment online. So much so that they could not actually go back to where they were from. They were completely shunned. And also when we talk about shadow banning, that's also shadow banning. Um, but in that, I also saw glimmers of hope. And glimmers of hope were, for example, when I was in Jordan, um, I met a number of uh, a, a number of technologists who are developing uh, digital apps and products that ensure that women are safe online. And one of them is called Amanha, um, and it's actually really just truly is designed to promote digital security and digital safety for women. So it's just again in giving you one example. And the last uh, but not least, um, I think this goes without saying, but I just think this is so important. Uh, we need to make sure that youth are at the table. Uh, youth are the next generation, and as we're here sitting, talking on, in person and in virtually around these issues, 
we need to make sure that youth, the investment in youth on these issues is paramount and it's really critical. It is critical in all, again, facets of society, whether we're talking about to ensure that they are, we inspire them to um, you know, take positions in the public life and civil society, in the private sector, other forms of private sector as well as technology sectors. And of course, we're uh, making investments as well. But again, the last thing I'll say, and I know we're short on time, and Kaylin, I don't know if you, uh, if you want to add anything to this, um, is this. No government can do this alone. Even though I'm here representing the government perspective here in the US government, no government can do this alone. No civil society actor can do this alone or private sector entity. That is why it is so critical and I firmly believe in the multi-stakeholder, not just convenings, but ensuring that we have multi-stakeholder solutions to this problem. That I actually think is the beauty in the global, in, of the global partnership, why I think it's really great. Um, but also, again, it's part of the solutions building. It's just so important that we take these big ideas, everything that's happening at the global level, all of these amazing convenings that we're having this week and in so many other for us, and translate them to action at the local level because multi-stakeholderism needs to be built at the country level and as well at the subnational level. And then when you marry the two from global to local, then I think we're gonna, we can, not gonna start, but can continue to start making and seeing meaningful progress. I'll stop there. Well, as we are running out of time, the best we we don't going to have like time to actually hear from the people on the floor about the topic. So I will really thank you to all of you for reminding us first, like uh, the importance of having grassroots movement working in different aspects of digital rights. Uh, how economical rights are related with other human rights and how this important to get to get data on gen gender data uh, to improve the quality of life, not only of women, but also gender diverse people. How multi stakeholder is essential in all the processes that we want to uh, address and, and all the changes that we want to. Uh, also, how how the own agency or individuals that are women, gender diverse people, or or are part of the homogenized or underrepresented population is important in this factor. And finally, uh, uh, how policies are necessary also in all these processes and how representation should be meaningful and we had always a uh, call to action in order to get the changes that we need and having always as I said before the multi-stakeholder uh, approach thank you very much for your interventions and for your time and Yes, if you want to reach any of the panelists, you can find uh, the information on most of them in the in the in the session page, and also you can reach me as Umu Pajaro. I will share some information about them if you authorize me, <laughs> and also you can follow the Gender Standing Group, and I will share with you anything that you wanted to know. Uh, thank you very much, and. That's all for now.